know, let's just, if you're okay, let's just keep it in this mode because it went blue when I put it Oh, okay. Okay, so, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so again, just as a little recap, um, you guys can see the screens. When we talk about market sizing, what we're talking about is the, it could be a, a number of different metrics. It could be either the number of consumers, or it could be the number of dollars or units for a particular product. So, you know, and again, we talked about why it's important to do market sizing. It's important for a couple reasons. One, it helps as an input for forecasting. So, if we know the size of a market, you know, for instance, some markets are just growing. It's not because one of the companies is a much better uh, marketer than another. It's just the market is growing. You know, we, we know that because sometimes demographics are, are forcing increase in a, in a market. Sometimes it's just because of a particular migration, like when we talked about uh, people migrating from old technology to new technology. Um, you know, you do, you, sometimes you don't have to do anything in the market. It's going to grow somewhat just because of those kind of market factors. Um, and again, if um, you're marketing uh, a new line extension, then you would want to see you know, is, does the market, is it going to support an extension in a line? Like sometimes you wonder how different companies come up with all the different flavors and the different variations of their product. Well, if they're smart, they're doing market sizing to make sure that the market can um, absorb another line extension and it's not cannibalizing one of the ones they already have. So if they're smart, they're doing some sort of market sizing before they launch a new product or a line extension. So then we talked about the reasons when we might want to size a market. So new product development is clearly one situation where we would want to size a market. And um, you know, if you're not in a quote, you know, manufacturing company, maybe you're in a media media company, or um, your either your website, your magazine, your um, television program, whatever it is. You might want to size the market to see if there's an audience for a particular media product. So um, if you're addressing a new audience, you might want to size that particular uh, audience to see if it's big enough to develop and, and produce a new media property. And then finally, um, we talked about business acquisition a little bit before. Business ac acquisition is always key because sometimes, you know, I've heard Again, some of my some of my students from uh, NYU. One of the things they have to do is a capstone with an entire uh, business pitch, and they have to invent a product and so forth. And sometimes they they talk about a product. And, you know, is there even a market for that? One of the reasons that um, uh, we talk about market sizing is you know you don't want to launch a business if there's no market for it. It's just a, it's a waste of time. Plus, nobody will invest in it. How many people in here watch Shark Tank? Anybody? Okay, so you hear them talk about that. Is there a market for this? Do people really want it? What they're saying is, is there, you know, to, to, you size your market properly. They don't necessarily say it in those words, but that's what they're saying. You know, is there a market for this? That's like saying, well, what size is this market? And then um, another, another reason you might want to size the market is to see if you can develop demand forecasts for an existing product. Okay, so the considerations of the primary or secondary to the end of the market. So we are, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, primary is the entire market, and secondary demand is uh, for a particular product or segment. So, for example, we're talking about the diaper market. Um, the entire diaper market would be your primary demand, whereas your secondary demand might be disposable diapers or campers. So if we like. Continue on this path, just sort of considering primary and secondary demand. This is the audience participation part of the discussion. If I say razors is our primary demand, what would examples of secondary demand be? Like creams or blades? Like yeah, like how many blades? Like the number of blades. What else? Anybody sticking with razors? Disposable razors. Disposable. Good one. Safety. Electric. Electric. Okay. Okay, so you guys got it. Okay, what about when we talk about pain relievers? 
name brand versus off brand. Okay, name brand versus store brand. Medical grade? I'm sorry? No, hospital grade? No, hospital grade. Prescription. Could be based on other factors too, like uh, anti inflammatory, uh, vascular dilators. Okay, okay. I mean, one of the ways that the market segments is based on what is the component is it aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, right? That's like one of the ways the market segments. Um, what else? Adult or for children? Okay. Anybody else got something? Oh, along that same line, then you would also have regular strength and extra strength. Regular strength, extra strength. Anybody else? What about anybody a Shaquille O'Neal fan? He's got that <laughs> device. He's putting on his back and he pushes a button. There's internal and external, right? There's the stuff that you rub on, you know, your legs, like the ligaments. That's a pain reliever. There's the mechanical devices that relieve pain. I mean, there's all sorts of pain relieving devices, right? And they're all competing because they are all trying to do the same thing. They're trying to solve this pain problem for the consumer. So the question is, though, when you actually got down to it, would some consumers really, you know, some consumers are really like, I want to just take a pill and make my pain go away. Other people are much more open. Well, if it's that thing I got to slap on my back like Shaquille O'Neal uses, I'm perfectly happy that it solves my pain. You know, some people are like, well, I don't want to do that. It's a little wacky. It doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. So you really have to think about when you're sizing a market because if you thought this was, even if that thing that Shaquille O'Neal is selling is the greatest thing ever, it's like some people just won't use it because it doesn't make sense to them. So you need to size the market from the standpoint of can you get people to try that if you know they really have a bias that that's not the way you solve pain. Okay, so since it's uh, the day after the introduction of the iPhone S, 6, what is it, 6S, IS, whatever it is. Um, what about cell phones? How can we segment the cell phone market? Besides, if that's the primary demand, what is secondary? Smart versus high Smart versus like a feature phone, a dumb phone. <laughs> Smart versus dumb, right. Okay, then there's the brand names. Anybody in here have a collector? Yeah, those people are getting fewer in present chain. You can find more of them in New York. Okay, I, I didn't know they understood it. Um, okay, so there's smartphones. Um, there's the, the versus feature phones. There's the, the carrier, right? The operating system we can segment based on uh, Android, iOS, or what? Windows? Is that the third one? Is it? Yeah. So you can segment on. Oh, by the way, um, did you guys hear about Amazon lowering the price to 99 cents of their phones? Yeah. Of course, I don't know whether they're going to get to buy it. The two year contract. The fire phone? Yeah. Did you get it for a buck then? With two year contract. I know, like, just for iPhone 6 sales. That's cool. Wow. So, okay, so okay, so there's a lot of different ways we can say the cell phone market. Now, what about cars? What about cars? Electric this is a car town. I know that. Electrical or gas? Electrical versus gas. Okay, that's one. Grand. Grand size. Luxury versus uh, different utilities and transportation. Luxury or uh, compact. Um, All right, but you can see why it's important, right? Because if you produce a car, then you have to say, well, of all the other cars, what's a competitive set? So one one parameter is also domestic versus foreign, because some people are snooty. Oh, I'm only a foreign car. I'm not going to buy a domestic car. You know, so you have to think about that. What else? Anything else? The use of the vehicle. You've got I mean, trucks versus cars or jeeps. You know. Uh, for different things. Color. Automatic versus manual transmission. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways, right? That you can segment all of these markets. So this becomes like a, a different thing about um, you're going to introduce a product. You want to think about all these different things because the consumer sure does. The consumer, you know, when they go and buy a product, they have all the different attributes of the product to think of. So you need to narrow in. And figure out exactly where does your product fit in the whole competitive set. Okay. So then we come to the considerations of sizing the market. 
So we talked about this a little bit while we were trying to get the whole setup going. Does a product represent a new technology or product that consumers have never seen before? If that's the case, then one of the things that makes it a little bit more challenging to size the market is you have to actually do some market research to figure out um, would a consumer want this product? For instance, um, one, of my, one of my students at NYU for their capstone project had envisioned a toothpaste that also had some sort of a, I guess I, you would have to call it a drug, such that when you brushed your teeth, they would, you know, you would get a little sleepy. Now, because uh, this would be the toothpaste you use right before you go to bed, and if you have problems sleeping at night, then this toothpaste would somehow have a drug in it that would sort of seep into your gums. And again, you know, this comes to be like a sort of a thing where it's neither a toothpaste nor a sleep aid, and so you need to think about, you know, it's kind of one of these things that nobody's ever seen before, so you need to do market research to people that actually use a sleep aid and say, well, what if you got your sleep aid in this way? Would that be something you would want to do? Because you wouldn't be able to just sort of slam dunk take a um, an existing product category and say that my product, you know, is similar to these other products. So I want to see how much market share I can get. Um, it would actually considerably be like a brand new product, and you have to do a little more, more market research to sort of say, is this something that people even want? Maybe nobody wants that. You know. Oh, that seems weird to me. Um, I'd be afraid if my kid grabbed that tube of toothpaste and started using it, and they fall asleep at school, and you know that you know. So you, you would, might, there might be a whole host of things that you would never even think about with that product that you would need to research ahead of time. Okay. So the second thing is, does the product answer uh, an existing market? Um, is the product an, you know, fit into an existing market, but answers an unmet need among consumers based on the current offering? So a perfect example of this, and I think I have a slide on it a little bit later. Um, again, you guys are a lot younger than me. But back in the mid-80s, you know, the big deal about disposable diapers was that they were disposable. And then um, companies like Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark started realizing that there were certain little problems with some of the diapers that were on the market, like um, they would work better if they had the tape you know, so that the parents didn't have to have safety pins, or they would even work better if there was elastic around the legs so that they could the kids more like a piece of clothing rather than uh, a diaper. And so all of these enhancements started coming out with, um, with respect to diapers, and it's really amazing to see how the market share shifted. So the question is, is if you're developing a product that's just a, an improvement in an existing marketplace, um, how do you think that's going to skew people coming over to your product and leaving maybe the current companies that they're doing business with. So um, that becomes a different process in sizing the market. And then finally, um, is there an opportunity to grab market share by alleviating confusion with respect to consumers? So that was the third thing uh, that I mentioned briefly when I was talking about the band of Soleil example. Um, sometimes if you're you know, a, a competitor in what we call a confusing uh, market category, you can do something to educate the consumer, be their friend, and then you can grab market share based on that. So you end up to, to size the market, you have to figure out, well, how many people are confused and how many people will come to my brand because I'm, I make more sense to them. So. I mean, I don't know if, you, if it makes sense for you guys to think of any uh, current categories in, uh, you know, products that are confusing that you wish someone would come back for it and, and, you know, uh, alleviate the confusion. Okay, so we actually go about the process of establishing the size of the market. Okay, so generally, we typically deal with a secondary market. So if we want to enter an existing market, we might estimate what we might gain in market share from established competitors. Um, on, unfortunately, this can't always be the case because sometimes we can't use existing research to gauge our established primary market first and then figure out what our share of it is. Um, other times, if it's you know representing a new technology, 
you have to make certain assumptions about ultimately um, how many people will want this new technology so that you can size the market. And then it's, it's really kind of based on market research and certain assumptions you would make flowing off of that. So just to give you a sense of how we might do this, we're going to consider a primary market, which is the diverse market in the United States. Okay, so how many people in here are parents? Anyone? Okay, so we have a couple parents. So how old are your children? I might ask. He's five. Five. Um, I've got a couple of them. Okay, so but they're beyond the diaper stage. No. Yeah. No. Okay. So unfortunately, right now. So right tell me. Okay, so so you're one story. When your your child is five, when you first started, obviously it's huge change. Not having a kid and having a kid. Right. Big deal. Like your whole life turns upside down. You're, you get a completely new focus. Were you surprised how many diapers you went through initially? Yeah. And may I ask you, are you surprised about the quantity? Or is it mostly left to your wife because you don't really know much? <laughs> no, I was uh, I was mostly surprised when they were really little, like first born, as opposed to later on when it well, to taper off. Well, yeah, when it tapers off, you're, you're glad, but when you, they're, they're very little, it's, it's kind of surprising, isn't it? It's like every hour. Yeah, every hour. Every hour. At least, right? So, well, if you're lucky. Sleep sleep. <laughs> okay, so the question is, if you were going to, it's, it's actually well documented, you know, the size of the diaper market, but if you were going to size it, and again, the reason I go through this whole exercise is because, again, if you ended up interviewing, a lot of agencies ask these kind of questions. Um, they're, they're called case questions. And so, so the case of building the market demand for uh, diapers, you know, the question is, well, what would you use to build this market demand? First of all, uh, name me a child that's born that doesn't need a diaper. Is there one? No. All kids need diapers. The question is, how many kids are there? How many diapers might they use? Um, cert certain things like that, which are well documented. So, as I have up here, we have a few questions that you might need to know if you were going to size the diaper market. One thing you could do, which would make it really simple, would be to get category information from a CPG company like uh, a Nielsen or an IRI. So, Nielsen and IRI both provide um, the point of sale. Uh, you know, units sold, dollars sold, etc. Um, that flows out of the POS systems and you know, grocery stores, mass merchandisers, and so forth. Second thing you could do would be conduct um, a search on other secondary research. So, um, secondary research is research that is out there, but maybe has been done for a different purpose. So one such example of how secondary research might be helpful here is just to understand how the population is growing because obviously the census would pull in that kind of information and you could use census information as secondary research to get an understanding of how many people are being born into your market. And then second, as thirdly, you would want to know um, how many diapers are used on a per day basis by a baby and the average lifetime of a diaper user. So these are all things, and it's just, you know, the next few slides are just kind of examples of how this information uh, comes, comes up. So <coughs> this is trended data of birth rates and number of births from 1919 through 2009. Oh, 1910 through 2009. And if you're like a data geek the way I am, you'll like to look at that for a little while and see um, the red line is birth rate, meaning that the birth rate is kind of stabilizing and slowing down. Um, and the population rate is a little bit more fluctuating. Um, but uh, the birth rate on a per thousand basis, as it stands right now, is at about at 13. And that's shown in this particular slide. Okay. What's interesting about this slide, and you might not be able to see it too well on the screen, but when you get a copy of it, this is actually on a state by state and US territories. The difference in birth rates per thousand um, for all the different states. 
So, you know, some places like Vermont and New Hampshire are kind of on the low end. Vic, Maine is actually quite low, uh, 9.8 births per thousand. But then you got a state like Utah, which is basically double the rate of uh, births uh, of Maine. And again, it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, not really, doesn't really have any bearing on our, our market sizing study. So we also need the population, which as of uh, 2013, um, the population estimate is 316.16 million. And again, if you're a data geek, there's a couple of uh, good links there. One thing that's very interesting is this thing that's the population clock. And I couldn't even tell you, if you're like a data geek the way I am, it tells, if there's like a little bar, how many people are being born, how many people are dying, and how many people are immigrating for a net increase in the population. And this population clock on a second by second basis basically is calculating about how many people are here in the U.S. at this moment based on, on those kind of factors. Not that we need to be that scientific about it, but it's very interesting. So then we get to the calculation part of it. So if we were going to try to figure out about how many people, or how many children were going to be born uh, in 2014, we take the number of the 13 births per thousand in 2010. Again, this is a little approximate because we don't have the number of births per thousand for um, 2013 or 2014. I couldn't find that information. But that's fine because it's still, um, it's still a good approximation. And we know what our population is <clears throat> as of 2013. It's 316.16 million. And so in terms of thousands, that translates into 316,160. So if, if there's 13 births for every thousand, we would just simply multiply that out and we would expect 4.11 million children to be born in 2014. So this is a key piece of information in the diaper market. Again, why? Because, as, as I said before, we don't expect there to be a child born that doesn't need a diaper. 100% of them will need diapers. So this is our demand for new diaper customers. So then the other important questions that we have is how many diapers does a child use per day, and how long do children use diapers? And for this, I had to do some internet research. So, <clears throat> so one piece of information tells us that at the age of 24 months, on average, um, the child could typically train and no longer require diapers. And the exact quote is, statistically, the average age of readiness seems to be 24 months, with the average age of success is 27 months, but whose child is average? So in other words, it's like, kind of like your actual mileage may vary kind of disclaimer. So it, we figure it, that on average, the length of time we can actually sell a diaper uh, to a family that has a, a new child would probably be about 24 months, but maybe a little longer, maybe a little less. Yeah, so it's just all about through point? Just, yeah. It's just through yeah. point? Yeah, and the, the, the source there is um, drhull.com, some sort of baby expert that has a website. So um, the second is from a website called um, Around the clock, to six months old, you use approximately 10 to 12 diapers per day. What, by the time a child is age 6 to 12, um, the usage is 8 to 10. And then from 12 to 24, it's 6 to 8. And while they're in training, it might be 2 to 4. So again, um, if we were going to build a full demand model for diapers, we would set up a spreadsheet and we would estimate, OK, this is the number of new children that are born in uh, 2014, and we would flow it out by months, and we would say, okay, in 2013, the children that were born then, how old are they? We would fit this all into like a, a forecasting model. But just to give you a sense of how this all works, in the next step, if we started out with our, our 4.11 billion newborns, and 11 diapers a day, 11 because it's between 10 and 12, and that's our estimate. And if we were just looking at the number of diapers in six months, because that's how many newborns to six months old use, we would end up with 
billion dollars. So I remember the first time I did this calculation, and I was, I was actually a little surprised. 8.2 8 billion, that's a huge number. It's a lot of diapers. And um, a colleague uh, on my team said to me, well, that's why, you know, I think I've done my part for the environment like, by not having children because, you know, she's like thinking all of these diapers in a landfill. So she says, I don't care about recycling. I, I, my, I did my part by not having kids. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's kind of interesting or, you know, interesting logic. But, I mean, it is a huge number and it does bring up this question um, that as the world moves further and further along this path of trying to be green, um, when are we going to see the green diaper? You know, when are we going to see someone introduce that? Because, um, you know, we've got entire, is, it, is the whole state of California against uh, plastic bags now? Well, well, I mean, I, yeah, I just know when I was in San Francisco a few weeks ago, it's like, like it's Subway and stuff, there were no plastic, you know, however, Subway's always in a plastic bag here and there, it's paper. And so when they try to give you the sandwich, you can go out of bag. Yeah, but isn't San Francisco kind of a skewed market? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, it, could be, it could be a bellwether. You know, it's skewed, but like in 10 years, maybe everybody will be there. Yeah. Well, green diapers is what everyone knew before there were diapers. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, with they, when they sold the disposable, they were saying how much cleaner the disposable was because there would be diaper services. And so, you know, you wouldn't have a truck running up and down your street delivering the clean diapers and taking away the dirty ones. So it's very interesting the way they played that off. Of course, now we have electric cars, so, you know, that could be a cleaner option. To some degree, there is a big push to go back to cloth diapering, and they've developed new and better cloth diapers. And there's small entrepreneurs and websites out there that sell those kind of solutions, right? Um, it's a lot bigger than it used to be. Um, Cotton Babies is a nationwide chain of stores oh, that right. specializes okay. in those. Interesting, okay. That's like all they do. Okay. You know, again, it's one of these things, since I'm not in the category, I tell you, I've seen those stores and I'm like, whatever a Cotton Baby is, and I, I mean, I don't even walk in, I'm, I'm not in that category. So, That's what it is. Interesting. Um, cloth machine washable diapers. Got it. So when we have when we size a market in this way, the method is called the chain ratio method. So it's basically the chain ratio method specifically takes into account the universe of all possible buyers, and then you systematically winnow in on what you think your part of the market is. So, I need to see if I can find that. So now, briefly, this, briefly, I wanted to talk about this particular discussion topic of the greener diaper. So the idea of the greener diaper is it breaks down in landfills without sacrificing absorbency or comfort. And we would, if we wanted to, say, introduce a greener diaper into the marketplace, what would we do? How would we assess um, the market share that we could get with respect to um, the current competitors that are in the market? Obviously, you know, there's already a number of competitors in the marketplace, so we would have to, you know, our, our message would be that we're solving this unmet need. We have the uh, convenience of a disposable diaper, but the, you don't have any guilt because you know it will break down. And you don't have to feel guilty that it's a sacrifice and comfort for your child because we're going to engineer it to make sure it feels good for the child. So we would probably need to do a certain amount of market research. But the question is, you know, what, what would our consideration be in order that we would uh, be able to size our market? And while you're thinking about that, I just wanted to show this next uh, chart that I ran across. Because I think this is just so cool. This is the trended um, uh, percent of market share for diapers from 84 to 94. And why I really like it is this line here is Pampers. So think about it. They were kind of like at a 33% market share. And then when pull-offs got introduced, they started on a decline ever after that. So they were basically like the market leader or maybe tied with Kimberly Clark. But when pull-ups 
So in other words, you can say pull-ups didn't cannibalize the parent brand. It really hit Pampers. So, so that's the interesting thing. When you introduce a new product, um, you want to really make sure, especially if you already have some kind of shared line extension, you want to make sure that the line extension does not hit your, your brand. You want to make sure it, it attacks uh, the competitors. Um, in fact, well, the other thing that's kind of interesting is it looks like um, Procter & Gamble introduced gloves, I guess, sometime before that, and gloves kind of peaked at about the same time that uh, pull-ups, so that consumers actually kind of understood these two brands to be more competitive, but um, the parent P&G brand. And then what's interesting is, the other thing that's just really interesting is that late in the trend, private label became uh, very strong, just I guess because all of these other competitors are pricing themselves so high, and there's obviously a second market where I don't want to pay a lot of just throw these darn things away. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just let's just buy whatever's cheap and does the job, you know. So so what let's let's take a couple of minutes and just think about the considerations um, with respect to if we were going to introduce a mark uh, a new product in this market and what um, we might want to think about. So if we're introducing a green um, disposable diaper, so clearly this is an existing product, or sorry, a new product in an existing market. Now, do we, who do we think this product is going to source uh, volume from? Any ideas? Are you talking brands or market? Yeah, it's like, do, do we think it's going to hit one brand more than another, or just do we think it's going to hit all of them? So it only starts line from all of them. Maybe not 100% evenly, but maybe in proportion, more or less, right? It depends. Um, if there's some that have already kind of specialized in, like, not having certain chemicals, and they've really heavily advertised that, it might hit them a little bit harder. Okay, so it may impact all, but to different degrees. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, um, I didn't realize um, that there was like this established cotton, you know, washable diaper market that was already available. So it's possible that a disposable diaper will not just source from other disposable diapers. It might source from people that are like, you know, I really don't feel like washing these things anymore. If it breaks down in landfill, that's really kind of good enough for me. So it, it may impact all different disposable, but at varying degrees. And it may also source from non-disposable. Now, how do we figure this out? How do we figure out whether we're going to get our volume from here or from here, and whether or not this is going to be a big enough market that we can move to the next step, which would be maybe test marketing. We have to do market research, right? We have to. Um, okay, so how would we go about market research? Well, right. We would have to actually conduct the research and identify households that either had a child in the household that was of the age of wearing a diaper, or uh, households where they were expecting a child in the next year 
and ask them their views on these things. Ask them to rate on different parameters, you know, what are the most important attributes that you would consider in purchasing a diaper. Um, you know, would it be a, a doctor's recommendation or another mom's recommendation of a diaper? Or would it be this whole issue of impact of the environment? Or would it be comfort for the baby? Or would it be the ability of the diaper to alleviate um, spillage? Uh, whatever, you know. So you have to think about all the potential attributes of the diaper. And again, one of the things you have to think about is all of these brands were, were kind of launched based on their, I mean, in the old days, well, in the old days, there were no disposable diapers. But when there were disposable diapers, the only thing they had going for them is they were disposable. And then there were all the innovations that kind of came after it. So one of the things you have to figure out is, of all the innovations that we now just sort of take for granted, um, which ones are the most important for you to communicate, you know, in addition to the fact that your new product is also going to be biodegradable and have a limited environmental impact. So that would be the nature of the research. So you would have to think about the attributes, because that's going to help you shape your messaging. OK, but there's something that's even, uh, another thing that's even just as important in terms of what are the attributes that are, that are the most important to consumers, such that you can shape your messaging. What's an even more important question to ask in the market research when you're talking about a new product launch? Cost. Well, cost. I'll write that down. It wasn't what I was thinking of, but what they're willing to pay. Something even more important than that. How about intent to purchase? Would asking the question, would you purchase based on all the other products that are on the market? If we had one that had this attribute, would you consider purchasing? So it's like purchase consideration. And the third, well, one other thing that I always think about, and um, this one is slightly tricky, um, and I'll tell you why I think about it in a second. I think about current brand loyalty. You know, so if the, if the family, this is, you know, they're, they're having another child, and they're a Pampers family, or you know, a pull-ups family or a loves family, and they're probably like, oh, that worked so well with the first kid, now we're going to have another one, you know, we'll probably get the same brand. You know, the question is, how loyal are they? So, so brand loyalty is pretty key. Now, again, when you think about brand loyalty, uh, brand loyalty also has a lot to do with swings and market share uh, in any category, just because there's some people that are completely price-driven, so if you price your product, you know, a few cents under your competitors, you're going to get a certain bump in market share. So brand loyalty becomes key because you want to ask a question, um, if you find somebody that's brand loyal, well, what would it take for you to consider another brand? You know, or even with you? Because then you can sort of figure out if there's a certain segment of the population that's so brand loyal that you would never be able to get them. But for market, it's less of a consideration why. Okay, so I said that while brand loyalty is important for the diaper market, it's maybe less important than for other categories. Why would I say that? Anybody have a guess? Food market? Well, no, that's not what I'm thinking about. The food market, um, exactly, it would be more important. Loyalty would be more important in the food market. Brand loyalty in the diaper market would be less important. Why would that be? Because you use so many of them? It's not just because you use so many of them. The market turns over, right? Mm -hmm. There's new kids being born all the time. So you might have a family that's a Pampers family, but they're not going to be using diapers, well, unless they're the daughters, those people, they're out of control. <laughs> they have a lot of kids, right? But in most families, they stop having kids at a certain point and they're out of the market. And brand new people come into the market and who have no loyalty. 
So you can start the loyalty connection new. So loyalty is, in general is a key thing when you're sizing a market, especially in a situation you're going into a market with a bunch of competitors. But it's, even though you have to consider it when you're in, a, in this kind of situation, perhaps for the diaper market, it's slightly less important than it might be for other categories because this whole, whole situation of the churn of the market and new people coming into the market all the time. Okay, so now, okay, how are we doing on time? I feel like I'm in the land with the other side. Okay, so we still have plenty of time to go over the, what we need to go over for the vitamin one. So now we're going to shift gears, take our minds off babies and diapers. Oh, actually, this is actually one, the one last slide which kind of ties it all together. Um, the diaper market, I found this thing, and um, it's actually fairly recent. Um, some guy actually put all the thoughts of the diaper market into one kind of uh, article, and he gave a forecast on um, the size of the disposable baby diaper market for the top 100 countries and why. And so I give you the link if you're really, now you're like, oh, she's stuck. I'm trying to find out about this. You can, you can go to this particular website. It has even got a uh, table to figure out, you know, of the top 100 countries, what, how many units are going to sold. And not surprisingly, um, the U.S. is at the top of the list. And I think it's just because we're um, kind of agnostic about our trash situation, I guess. It's like, okay, well, we've got a lot of trash. Big deal. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. Other countries, I think they have more of an environmental uh, policy, and so I don't think well, most other countries have come down um, on the spectrum of, you know, quite so much usage of, of disposable diapers. But, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting read, especially after getting from this. The other thing that I just want to say, if you, you know, this is an interesting read from the standpoint, again, um, you go out, you finish your degree, you go out in the world, you interview with, um, you know, you interview with an agency. A lot of agencies ask these case questions that are actually market sizing questions. So the more you start thinking about that and start looking at market sizing questions and seeing how people go through it, the better you will be prepared if you get an interview where they ask you that kind of question. Okay, so now we're shifting gears to the sports drink market. Okay, so this, um, this question about vitamin water, um, the first thing that I did was I wanted to kind of go and look at these various, like, to me it's like the size of the market. And this is actually really well documented, so that's like a plus for you guys because you don't have to go through and make a bunch of assumptions, it's pretty well documented because the beverage industry might, yeah. So, so the so the sports, uh, well, actually, all, the entire beverage market is really, really well documented. There's tons of industry journals that are devoted to, um, you know, how big is this segment, how big is that segment, and just so um, we kind of can get our minds wrapped around it. There's okay. This is sports drinks. On the left hand side are drinks. They call them non-aseptic. And again, this wasn't a category I ever looked at before, so I looked up and, and said, well, what's a septic? And all, you know, a septic just is, means that it's packaged in a particular guideline. It's um, basically the processing that controls the freshness and shelf stability and all that stuff. So there's not a septic, and then these are mixes. So that's one sort of sub-segmentation within the sports drink market. Now, um, what's in interesting is um, the non-aseptic sports drinks is a $4.1 billion business and this drink mixes is only a $58 million uh, business. So there's definitely not as much in play in terms of dollars and so forth in the mixed business. Now, um, yeah. Well, when I was uh, going through the 10K, I started pitting up the, the water market. 
because that's how I figured you know, vitamin water may be better. No, you're absolutely right. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So the vitamin water. You know, the way I thought about this whole thing was when I, you know, I started to look at it, I thought, well, are they trying? Is this whole thing about them trying to move vitamin water from the water category to the sports drink category? That was kind of my hypothesis. And the reason is, is what's happening in the water um, market is the, the volume is going to no label, you know, or, or store label waters. So everybody's kind of losing out in the water category because um, that's what, and, and the thing is, if you transform the product to a sports drink, you can charge a lot more. Because all of a sudden there's like some added value that gives you some kind of benefit for you know high exercise and so forth. So that's kind of what I thought might be happening with um, you know Coca-Cola doing doing what they're doing with it. So the competitive side, and the, I mean I I basically narrowed it into Gatorade and Powerade. I mean obviously Gatorade has a bunch of different line extensions, the so Gate G2 and all these things that we saw in the previous slide. But at the end of the day. The two main players are Gatorade and Powerade. And again, why is that an advantage? Because if there's only two competitors and there's a few different line extensions, it's really kind of easier to kind of penetrate you know, for, from a vitamin water perspective, right? So if they transform themselves from being a water to being a sports drink, they kind of say, well, we see how Gatorade has been accepted and what people think of it, and we see the power rate. So is there a positioning we could take that's distinct that will give us market share? Wouldn't that kind of be them competing with themselves? Because I think Coca-Cola owns power rate. Do they? I didn't know that. Do they? I think so. It makes sense. But it's hard. To, I'm not even seeing any break, breakdowns of anything other than just major, major brands. A major segments competitive. If you go on Coca Cola's website, you'll see how their brands. Well, I'm just looking through their 10K financials right now. I'm up to eight, eight pages out of oh, more than 120. <laughs> I'm just stuck out of the phone. Well, here's what I would say though, okay? Even if Power Aid is one of their products, it still seems like it would be to their advantage to introduce another. Uh, competitor because Gatorade's got 50% market share, and then the first Powerade's got 16.2, and then so on. If you added up all of the Powerades, they would still source more, probably all of the things being equal, source more volume from uh, Gatorade. So it would still be to their advantage to compete against themselves in that, in that category. But it's a good point, and I didn't, and I didn't know that. Oh yeah, if they own the market for the top three brands, they're still, you know, they're yeah. making all the money. Yeah. Okay, so then, um, just to, um, again, thinking of the energy drink market, um, not to say that they're going to go that route, but this energy drink market is, again, another thing altogether, and it's pretty big. Um, you know, 8.2 billion, um, and these are um, one of them's uh, energy shots. So these are energy shots, which is like a whole other thing. I mean, this just tells you how kind of segmented the, the beverage market is. So some energy drinks, I would say, are somewhat competitive with performance drinks, but they're not completely interchangeable because, as we know. Some people drink energy drinks when they have a bad hangover and they have to do something the next day. And that's the case when an energy drink might come to play. Um, and you might not be any, any kind of an athlete at all, and you might drink the occasional energy drink for those kind of reasons. So. So this one, um, and again, I apologize, this is actually kind of little. But what I liked about this um, slide was it says, well, where are the gains coming from? So it segments out the market. It's got on this slide, it's got energy drinks, sports drinks, um, and basically the gains are actually coming from um, the energy drinks. I think. Yes, the energy drinks on um, an increase year over year are up 13%. And for sports drinks, they're only up about 
So that's why, even though it will be very hard to transform vitamin water from where it is now to an energy drink, it's like there's a lot of growth in that market. So if that was the, the idea to transform vitamin water to an energy drink, they'd have to stick a lot of caffeine in it, and I don't know how else they have to do with it. But um, that's just the reason that I kind of introduced this information, because there's a lot of growth um, in that area. Um, so, and then there, on the other side of the column, there's a little bit of information about ready to drink tea and coffee. But, uh, but the growth from non-aseptic energy drinks was higher than any other component of the category. So that's one of the reasons why I introduced the information about the energy drink. So the question is, where does vitamin water compete? And as we already discussed, it competes in the water market. So, and then this was interesting. Now, this is 2013 data. But it's actually changed versus prior year. It's down 9.48%. So it needs to be revitalized. It needs some kind of new positioning or something. Um, it's pretty clear that that's um, an imperative for this particular brand. Um, you know, the private, and you can see private label is up 13.31. So if private label is up 13.31, it's very possible that a lot of the volume is sourced was from vitamin water. Smart water is up. So, um, you know, it's interesting to see the competitors that are up versus those that are down. Um, are there any surprises there? Well, you know, when you first look at a category, everything's surprising because you've never seen it before. But, you know, I mean, I don't think it's surprising the private label is up. Oh, question. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about fire water, but I've never recently seen. I just looked up. It actually did come out in the energy drink. It's, it's a natural. They use like green coffee beans, and it's actually canned like a, like a monster or like most. And is it branded with the vitamin water? Yeah, name? it says vitamin water energy. Oh wow, interesting. Yeah. Oh, I remember sure. it just came out. I remember seeing it. I don't. Drink that stuff very much. I thought I saw it, so I looked it up and it's on their website. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's a good, good play on their parts. It's, that's a really growing section. Especially with green beans. That's really healthy. Apparently. Yes. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it made from green coffee bean mixture. Okay. So, let's see. So, the size of the category uh, for bottled of water. Is 6.7 million, and again, this is 2012 data because I couldn't. Um, that one slide I showed you, even though it's for category, so I don't have a full category number for our 2013. But as of 2012, um, the size of this category is 6.7 billion, and vitamin water had a 3.2 share, which. Um, Again, that's not a huge share, but one of the things that I encourage you to think about is, again, I have to use my calculator, if, if the size of a category is um, 6.7 billion, and let's see, vitamin water, doing a calculation, which was helpful is if you've got um, a six billion category, so each share point is worth sixty million. So that's what you think you have to think about. Like, okay, so they were only got a, only got a three point two share. If we move the needle. Each time you bring it up one full share point, that's $60 million. So believe me, in the water category, as cheap as water is, in the profit margin, that's big, that's big money. If you could just move the needle a little bit, that's big money. So, yeah, question. Would a uh, meter 10 roughly uh, end up being a meter 600 million? Like that, would that be the, a loss? Well, it's, a, it's more, probably more of an opportunity loss because obviously the cost of goods and so forth isn't really too high. But I mean, they're already, um, you know, in the they're already in this category. They don't want to give up. Plus, you know, they're Coca-Cola. You know, they're part of Coca-Cola. 
they should be able to figure out their way to um, market or position themselves for some gains here. Um, and the other thing, you know, this would be where, and again, we're not talking about this on this particular discussion, but um, this is where like a marketing mix model would come into play. You know, one way they could gain share is if they drop their price, right? Because they make a little bit less money, but maybe overall they would make a lot more money because they could grab more market share, could make it up in volume. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that I, I'm not 100% sure what this whole assignment is with the AMA, but um, one of the things that you would want to look at is a full competitive analysis between vitamin water and all competitors and see, you know, are they charging some sort of a premium that maybe if they price themselves somewhere um, below, or sorry, above um, the store brands, but not you know, too far above it, maybe a consumer would say, wow, I can get water, and it's a brand name water, and it's almost as cheap as the store brand. Whether or not, you know, that would work for their financials. I, I don't know. But I mean, clearly, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, Perry and I have worked with the water category before. We had um, Dan and water as a client, um, and this is a hugely profitable uh, business. So, um, you know, it's possible that they might be able to um, gain enough volume that even if they're losing a price on each unit, that they could p and out to an overall higher profit for the organization. And one of the things I do have for three MBA guys doing is looking at kind of the cost of the not like the as well. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I just looked up, up that information, and I'll tell you, uh, Coca-Cola is a price setter. They control everything from the supply chain side to the, you know, what they're getting I mean, and uh, distribution channels. They own it. So if they you know, drop their price to say, like, not $40 or whatever, I saw it in the store, I can like, get vitamins of water or I can get regular water for the same price. Yeah, or even if there's just a few cents more, I'm like, 10 bucks for this, 10 bucks for that, and I'm getting you know, vitamins. Yeah, I jump on that. I mean, they would need to. They would need to, you know, message it out there as well. You know, but still, it, it could be it could be the play that they, you know, a play they could employ. Um, so then the other challenge is that we talked about this a little bit earlier, which is, this is actually from Huffington Post, which is obviously the most reputable source on the internet. But I just really like their headline: "New Vitamin Water Swaps Sugar for Stevia." Grosses out pains. <laughs> yeah. So um, what I also liked is that they actually included some of the Facebook posts uh, that people were going to the Facebook page for vitamin water and just really venting about how much they hated this reformulation. So, uh, but then again, one of the um, resources that I give you at the end is actually, and you can click on the link and look at it. It's um, I think she's head of operations for Alameda, which is a manufacturing company in Thailand that produces commercial quality stevia. So they're basically the company that, that supplies stevia to any you know kind of off-the-shelf product that uses stevia. And um, her whole point of view was she thought it was um, stevia was being scapegoated. In other words. Something else was wrong with this reformulation, and her reasoning was that um, vitamin water zero is 100% stevia. There's no sugar in it at all, whereas the you know flagship vitamin water is some stevia, some sugar, and probably some other things were reformulated. And so, in in that net sense, when everybody started complaining about it, it was the easiest thing. Uh, for people to sort of look at it, oh, this one has stevia, and the other one didn't know that must be what it is. And you know, obviously, vitamin water never, uh, the, you know, the, the brand people never went to um, kind of correct it. This article is kind of interesting because they made it seem like um, vitamin water was really caught unaware that this, you know, was happening, and they said that there was a lot of just hastily uh, typed responses every time somebody complained about it. In other words, they didn't even have a communication strategy about how to deal with that complaint. It's just some poor, some poor community manager. Oh, we're sorry. Thank you for your feedback. Oh, we're sorry. Thank you for your feedback. You know, they didn't really have anything else they could they could say or do 
about this really big fiasco that they were facing. So this is like all over Facebook. Um, apparently it is. I mean, I, I didn't actually have to confess. I didn't go to the Facebook page because I saw a couple of articles where they cut and pasted um, Facebook posts in it, and so I kind of just read it that way. So honestly, what's Stevia, and why would people give that in an uproar? If it takes nasty, you would do it. So. Well, um, I think they learned a lesson with Diet Coke. Stevia, I thought it tasted okay, didn't it? Did you ever just try stevia? Um, okay. Look, I'm not the same thing. I like sweet blood, so that's, that's for me too. Look at my brain sweet and high. <laughs> no. Okay. So then we get to your assignment. Um, okay. I should probably the the assignment should be probably to review the sports drink and water categories. So both of them. And you want to think about the relationship between water, sports drink, and energy drink. And the question is, what should the strategy provide in water be if the objective, if the objective is to move water, you know, from the water category to the sports drink category? Because to me, that seems like the obvious play here. Um, you know, it's got vitamins in it already, and people who um, you know, are into sports uh, or health, um, maybe Gatorade isn't the right thing, but maybe vitamin is, because if you're the casual exerciser, you want something that will hydrate you, and you don't need as much hydration, or you need to have your electrolytes balanced out the way Gatorade will do, but maybe you do need some rehydration, and as long as you're so worried about your health and fitness and everything anyway, why not drink the of water that has vitamins? And that to me seemed like the obvious um, move for vitamin water because then it gets them out of the um, the water category, which that's not helpful for anybody. Um, unless vitamin water wanted to do a pricing strategy and then just price themselves slightly above private label water so that they could need like a differentiator where for a few cents more. So they were going to stay, to me, the play is if you're going to stay in the water category, you would do some sort of pricing strategy. But if you were going to leave the water category, you would have to think of a positioning that will work for you in the sports drink category. I don't think it makes sense to transform garden water into a sports drink, although it sounds like they're going to fit anyway based on, on your research. So, okay. So, um, so, you know, I, I bring up what are the challenges that vitamin water has that are in evidence in social media. And again, we might mention some of them here in this presentation that people don't like the taste. But I would say one of the things you would really want to do is, is actually do the visit to Facebook and see what's going on in Twitter because you're going to have a lot more flavor of really what people are saying about vitamin water um, if you go to those places and then understand from the consumer's perspective what's going on there. Um, and then the next bullet is to do a SWOT analysis between vitamin water and its competitors. Um, does anyone know what a SWOT analysis is? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Yes. So um, you would want to consider all the different channels and the positioning, the message, the uh, pricing, etc. I mean, um, it's hard to know how much budget is being used to, to promote different products. But you can sort of get a sense um, which ones are funded more than others based on how frequently you see advertisements and stuff. Um, and then based on this spot analysis, if I know water were to be repositioned as a sports drink, what kind of market share could it gain and where would they where would those gains come from? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so with this, uh, did you want to assign teams and have them? No, no, I'm going to have to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to email you guys later tonight. Catching orders and kind of everything that we're working on. So 
everybody's good with these types of projects? Uh, I don't know. We can, we can discuss if there's questions or whatnot. Um, I, mean, this is a, I mean, this isn't like, you know, something that's going to happen. Uh, I mean, this could be like enough for like a tour of creative design. Well, right? yeah, well, I really did not want these guys to do the SWOT analysis. I was going to have the MBA students do that for them. So the yeah, MBA students. So I think what I'd like to do is let's let's just throw out there, kind of what you guys think the competing brands are. Uh, uh, Audrey, we'll kind of start with maybe we'll kind of let you lead the discussion for the group, and let's just come to a consensus of what the three main brands we are. We can look at here. Okay. Are you comfortable doing that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. So obviously, Powerade and Gatorade. We've been talking about sports drinks. Um. Does anyone really drink sports drinks? Yeah. I do. I drink it, and I do drink it with sugar. So I have to when I'm out running. Well, Propel is Propel is what I was going to say. Yeah. My brother switches between Propel and sports. Yeah, that makes more sense. It makes more sense because that's more water based. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that you're gearing. Right. Right. I think there's a lot of blurriness between the, uh, under, you know, the sports drinks and the regular water. Sure. So that's why I kind of talked about both of them. Because they would be in a good spot if people were, like Propel, I think Propel's lines get blurred. You know, it's like some people perceive it more as a sports drink, and some people just perceive it more as a water. So they would be in a good position if they could do that with vitamin water. Yeah. Well, a sports drink, you know, it's definitely your eatery brand. Right. So they have to really reformulate vitamin water from just water. Right. Right. Uh, which then wouldn't be vitamin water, it would be a vitamin water brand, like not just energy drink. Right, 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 right. No, but, I, uh, I, I totally get that. But I also kind of look at it and I think, you know, the consumer doesn't know the structure of the of the entire category. The consumer may, you know, go to the store and say, well, I'm going to buy whatever's cheaper, whether it's Gatorade or Propel or whatever, you know. And the consumer might not even realize that Gatorade is a completely different formulation than Propel. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's really like the, the structure of the category is artificial based on those people that are actually operating in the category because they have other deep insights of what, of what these things are. So, I mean, I, I think you should really kind of at least look at both of the categories for sports drinks and um, water. Yeah, we agree for how it is. Yeah, how it came up. Well, let me interject. Uh, with 2011's uh, report, uh, they said uh, their six big competitors were Seal, Dizani, Bonacqua, Ice Dew, Kinley, and LaSalle's uh, Smart Water. So those are that's those are all waters. Yeah, those are all their the waters that you know yeah, they go said, back and yeah, find yeah, everyone yeah. drinks. But they didn't look at private labels being oh, there? Oh they've they've got tons of other things listed here. It's just, that was the water category. Oh, okay. I mean this is a hundred and seventy five page document, I just grabbed water. Oh. <laughs> but that's not what they're saying, Eric, is they consider the top competitors for vitamin water. Or for for just a water test, well, they just have okay. rank, they have different okay. everything broken down into right. segments. Okay. So they don't say vitamin water, but right. uh, maybe I have to do a little research and I'll hit you what up. See, of course, you have every sites. Again, I used to burn for a lot, but again, I consider the average totally different because that's what I consider. You know, well, give myself here. my carbs while I'm yeah. doing my long runs. Yeah. Here it's more. Uh, it's always associated with heavier sports, and there's they're so good at marketing. There's the yeah. I think it's fair to keep them there a little bit before yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, they've done a really good job at finding exactly where they are in the market. And I think that's another problem with vitamin water. They haven't. Nobody, you know, why, when would I use vitamin water? Oh, I'm feeling a little sick. Maybe there's some vitamin C in there. You know? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it, it seems like so many ingredients are different. Like there's. I drank it a few times, and when I think about it, when I would purchase it, it was for different reasons. And I think, like, they had one called Triple X, they had another one called Revive, and another one called Focus. And it does look like there's certain ingredients to where it, it's supposed mm -hmm. to do, you know, whether it's mainly or it's actually doing it, it's supposed to. And I think when I look at it, when I bought Vitamin Water a few times, it was for that reason, because I would rather have that than an energy drink that I probably didn't think was as good for me. Right. So, so, but they don't market in that way, right? They don't show like yeah, different, just, 
vignettes. Oh, I'm feeling a little fuzzy today, so I'm going to drink the vitamin water that helps me with mental clarity. Or, you know, they don't have like, you know, a situation where they help. So there's confusion in the marketplace with respect to this product. So maybe, you know, alleviating the confusion would help them. You know? So. Well, uh, we've got several, uh, seven different categories here. For sports drinks, they're, they're listing Powerade and Aquarius. Uh, for energy drinks, they burn. Relentless, NAS, and full throttle. They're not even looking at monsters. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there are still beverages as glass style vitamin water and so and fuse. So there's vitamin water coming in. Is it fuse and tea? Yeah. So but they just kind of break things down according to you know like how it's sell that and how perceptions are. And they explain that in you know, different little format up here. Mm -hmm. But I just want to hit you with what Coca Cola is putting in their you know, SEC filings. These are our big competitors right here. Right, right. Well, so the primary makeup of Gatorade and Powerade is it's just sugar and salt. That's right. how. But vitamin water doesn't have salt in it. Right. So, so it's, it's not addressing the electrolyte like Yeah. Yeah. But they still claim they have electrolytes in them. And they so, yeah, the revived ones, they do have electrolytes in it. I was looking at them, I think every bottle had electrolytes on the bottom. It shows all the ingredients and what vitamins are in there. And it actually, I think I looked at almost all of them, and they had like the plus. Well, do you think vitamin water isn't messaging the consumers properly when it has in terms of its benefits? They actually, oh, yeah. if you looked at their labels before they changed it over, and it was early this summer. They had like funny things written on the side, so maybe people perceived it to be kind of a joke in a way. I oh. thought it was funny, but yeah, I like oh, it. Yeah. I I feel like if we were to make a strong decision, which we we're gonna have to on certain things, to put them, you know, above the below, below the upper with, right. you know, this is everybody's water. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to be a major athlete. But you're not that person who's you know, sitting back and showing them a barbecue. This is for someone who wants to have a healthier lifestyle. Right, but I guess I, guess, I agree with that, but I still think the problem is, is they've got different varieties that are supposed yeah. to get different formulations of vitamins. So it's like, okay, this is this is the vitamin, this is the water for everybody, but which of the waters for everybody is the right water for me? Do you know what I mean? So it's so well, it's like almost water. like they, it, I mean, it could be, not to say it couldn't be done, it could be done, but there would have to be different like a campaign that basically said, oh, you know, something, you know, basically walking the consumer through it. Oh, yeah. you know, I need to be really sharp today because I'm having a presentation to my boss. Today my vitamin water is this. Um, so, you know, or today's the day I'm working out for two hours, you know. Um, today my vitamin water is this, you know. So that it basically, um, you know, you can basically tailor it to what you need on that on any given day. But they don't market it that way. You know, it's like a message that way, so how would a consumer figure that out? And right. I'm, going set, I'm going to set up a bottom fire for us as well, yeah. so as we find some of these articles, we can all post those. Does everybody in here know bottom fire? Yes, no. So B O M S Y R E, so just download that now. So it's a little orange flame oh, right. fire. Yeah, put it up there. And then I'm going to set up a uh, bottom fire and invite you guys while you do the link, and then you can get to the bottom fire. It's kind of like a private Facebook group. And then we can share articles, all that sort of stuff. You guys can converse and like one speak to other, whatever. So it's just yeah, for those who haven't used this, it's really nice for like sort of projects and stuff. Uh, but I just I just Google some stuff here in vitamin water. What about soap? Did you guys consider soap? Uh, yeah, they actually are the ones that actually are really similar to vitamin water. Yeah. They offer different. You know, different names for different purposes. Because here's a great article that I want to send you guys. You guys can just Google it. It's called Behind Gatorade's New Plan to Compete with Vitamin Water and Sobe. And this was just published in March of this year. And they're mentioning Propel, shifting its focus to routine exercisers. So they're also talking about how we can I think Sobe is actually in a position that it has been for, for roughly 10 years. They sponsor X Games, they sponsor this and that. They're getting their, their message out there to the people who they, they're targeting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they're on college campuses all over the place. I guess Biowater has, they've been, uh, like, uh, who is it? Kevin Hart, I think his name. They got like, a few commercials called like, Hydrate Russell or Hashtag How I Hustle. When I was looking on the site, it just kind of showed, I guess they're, they're targeting kind of like a younger, and it just kind of showed people 
performing, and obviously they have a star meeting, being a slow experience in the mouse. So here we go, it says the pedal controls 13% of the enhanced water when it comes to the pedal. Um, according to the package guide. So again, yeah, this thing is going to get some places where you can see that on this one. Yeah. Uh, it's important to say that the code comes from power it and by the water. And they just call it a huge pair of monsters. So they kind of have all the categories. Right, right, right. They got all the extreme sports. So they're kind of split. Yeah, yeah. yeah, some of that, though, is like um, it helps that they have bottling facilities and so forth, so they've got the efficiencies in the manufacturing side. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're sorted out to position. It's still, it's still very tricky to position each one of them separately so they're not penalized. Okay, guys, so I'll send you, I'll send you some emails, I'll set up a bonfire, I'll make sure this goes and this is a famous business. Brief work out what you have to give her So, you know, I think just, you know, start doing a little bit of researching and you find some interesting stuff. You know, just post it as my fire so we can all start sharing it. And uh, I'll keep you guys here watching a little bit later. Sound good? So you're going to like refine the assignment? Yeah, I'm going to refine it. Yeah. Okay. okay. So don't do the assignment until later. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I want to I use all your guys' time wisely. I want to take advantage of the guy who has the students that will kind of be behind the scenes again, not telling you what to do, but you can be having that helpful stuff together for you. Yeah. Uh, and you do this all the time. So, 